like the video. Pollsters should worry that their profession might soon be regarded as more like astrology than political science. Reasons to take polls with a large grain of salt abound. First, the nagging sense that pollsters are missing mega voters remains, as was the case during both the 2016 and 2020 elections. In both cycles, pollsters essentially got the Democratic share of the vote right but missed many voters who supported Donald Trump. Some have suggested that Trump voters are less likely to talk honestly with pollsters than Democratic voters are. Plus, pollsters get responses from only a tiny fraction of calls they place, so voters with the luxury of time and deep interest in politics skew the results. In 2020, polls gave a false sense of security for many House and Senate Democratic candidates. But that polling failure did not occur in 2018, when Trump was not on the ballot. So, is the worry of missing Republican voters valid this time around? It's a source of serious debate. A second reason for caution, some pollsters have reacted to their previous errors by overweighting survey results in the opposite direction. It's unlikely that Republicans have made up their deficit among women, for example, despite what some polls show. Similarly, it's unlikely that younger voters will show up as a fraction of their proportion in the 2018 or 2020 elections. Polls that show otherwise might be an indication that pollsters have overcompensated. Third, as early voting becomes increasingly popular, no one knows whether this behavior will affect voting outcomes or whether the past profile of early voters, heavily Democratic, will hold up. There is no doubt that early voting has become easier and more familiar for millions of voters, as the Center for Election Innovation and Research points out in a recent report. David Becker, who leads the center, tells me that 35 states offer every voter the choice to vote early or by mail, and another 11 offer early voting to all voters, requiring an excuse to vote by mail. While Republicans have certainly tried to restrict voting, he said, doing so might be hard when almost every voter will still find voting to be familiar, convenient, and safe. Please like the video. Political violence is not an unintended consequence of the mega movement. Much like Nike's swoosh, it is at the center of the movement's brand. Remember this when considering the intruder who, hyped up on the conspiracy theories Republicans bandy about, reportedly broke into Nancy Pelosi's home carrying zip ties. He then demanded to confront the House Speaker and cracked her husband's skull. Tellingly, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin joked about the horrifying incident, and House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, took his time before commenting on it. How could something like this happen? Well, as the Post reports, for a wide swath of Republicans, Pelosi is enemy number one, a target of the collective rage, conspiratorial thinking and overt misogyny that have marked the party's hard right turn in recent years. Among far-right extremist groups, the anti-Pelosi memes are often cruder and more violent, but the demonization of the Democratic House leader is no fringe phenomenon. Her face, sometimes adorned with devil's horns or a swastika, was plastered on signs at all the national rallies that led up to the January 6 storming of the Capitol. Indeed, the GOP has made it standard practice to demonize Democratic women. This includes Pelosi, of course, but also Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, New York, and Hillary Clinton. And don't forget Supreme Court Justice Ketun G. Brown Jackson, whom Republican members of the Senate Judiciary Committee accused of coddling child molesters during her confirmation hearings. The party has also spent years normalizing violence and violent rhetoric. Donald Trump, during his 2016 campaign rallies, suggested that attendees attack protesters and intimated that gun owners could take out Hillary Clinton. The phenomenon worsened during his presidency, including when he declared that there were very fine people on the side of the neo-Nazis during the violent white supremacist rally in Charlottesville. And it culminated on January 6, 2021, 
when Trump incited a mob to disrupt the counting of electoral votes at the U.S. Capitol and egg the rioters on as they closed in on the vice president. Please like the video. The midterm elections could have gone badly. Really badly. There were serious concerns that right-wing groups would resort to voter intimidation, violence, or other antics at polling places. But none of that came to fruition. In fact, while threats to democracy remain, 2022 might be seen as the point at which the erosion of democratic values and critical institutions was halted. There are seven reasons to be optimistic going forward. First, courts have proved adept at heading off election-related shenanigans. For example, democracy defenders in Arizona succeeded in obtaining an injunction against right-wing groups menacing drop box locations. Other courts issued a flurry of decisions to strengthen voting rights and free and fair elections before Election Day. Democratic election lawyer Mark Elias took note of four of those decisions that all arrived on November 3. As he wrote for Democracy Docket. In sum, courts remain a bulwark against election subversion and voter suppression. The election proceeded efficiently and with few glitches. Second, Massive early voting demonstrated the ability of voters to adjust to new election rules. Ultimately, nearly 47 million early votes were cast this year. Media outlets, candidates, and voters have become accustomed to the extended process of ballot counting, dampening claims that delays equate to voting fraud. Lo and behold, Republicans have largely conceded the races they lost, without fuss, as they are supposed to do. Third, Low turnout in competitive midterm contests is no longer the norm. The Post reports, turnout was especially high for a midterm in several battleground states, where expectations of a close contest appeared to boost voter participation. Voter turnout in Pennsylvania is on track to exceed 2018 by 4 percentage points. Nearly 6 in 10 eligible voters in Wisconsin and Michigan cast a ballot. While the nationwide vote total might not surpass that of 2018, it nevertheless remains relatively high. Please like the video. The contrast between the man likely to be the next House Speaker, Rep. Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, and the likely House Minority Leader, Rep. Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat New York, could not be greater. Nor could the contrast be more indicative of the current state of the parties. McCarthy remains hostage to the Christian nationalist base and the mega members who prioritize conflict with the Biden administration over governance. Jeffries, on the other hand, has broad appeal in his party and displays maturity and focus. Appearing on CNN's State of the Union on Sunday, Jeffries showed the discipline and generosity of spirit that no doubt pleased his predecessor, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat California. The key to her leadership, as it will be for Jeffries, is the ability to maintain unity in search of legislative deals and provide a contrast between a party that fights for working people and one that opposes reality and democratic governance. Asked about conflict between moderate and left-leaning members, Jeffries refused to accept the Democrats in disarray framing. He responded. And when it comes to supplying votes to avoid a default on the national debt, he was serene. Democrats have always been willing to lean in on making sure that we fully fund the government, Jeffries said. And Democrats have always been willing to lean in, in making sure that we meet our nation's obligations and do not default on our debt for the first time in American history. He added, that his party has consistently fought against extremism on the Republican side, including when it manifested itself often during the former president's tenure, while, at the same time, being able to find common ground to make progress for the American people. Jeffries underscored McCarthy's inability to break with a radical, unpopular agenda. Kevin McCarthy has said that he is willing to detonate the American economy, default on our nation's debt in order to try to strip away Social Security and Medicare for tens of millions of Americans. That's incredibly reckless. Please like the video. Donald Trump is running for president. Again.
The announcement landed with a thud. He is losing the moment. His sizzle is dying. Presidential politics is a business of alignment. A person meets a moment for which they are singularly suited and positioned. Trump had such a moment in 2016, with outside assistance, of course, but six years on, the country has changed. And so has he. He is no longer new to the political space. He is no longer the underdog and outsider. The narrative is stale. He is a twice impeached president who lost re election, cost his party in the last three elections, and is wading through an ocean of legal troubles. The arc of the story is one of dissent and desperation, fading light and dimming prospects. The scent of loss lingers on a candidate. That's why Trump has tried so hard to convince the world he didn't lose. But he did. And now, Trumpism is losing. Then there is the fickle nature or Republican fanaticism. Conservatives, broadly speaking, are addicted to the political equivalent of the tent revival, wanting to believe, wanting affirmation, exalting the traveling preacher until that person moves on and the next one arrives. They are adrenaline junkies forming serial attachments to the evangelists of their anger. Their devotion to one appears complete until it collapses or is supplanted by another. They are addicted to the feeling of falling in love. Trump is just the latest love affair, but it will inevitably end. The seasons always change, the bloom on the rose always fades. In 1994, Newt Gingrich rolled out his contract with America, a slate of conservative principles and policies. Republicans were able to push many of them through the legislative process, but their undoing came when they focused on personally attacking Bill Clinton rather than running on their successes. The 1998 midterms delivered stinging losses for the party. The year before, Gingrich had been reprimanded for ethics violations. After the disappointing 1998 results, he resigned from the House Speakership, and a few months later he would resign from the House altogether. In November 1994, according to Gallup, slightly more Americans had a favorable view of Gingrich than had a negative one. By the time he resigned, his approval rating was underwater, and more than a decade later, when he ran for president in 2012, the Washington Post called him the most disliked politician in America. Please like the video. I am overjoyed by the results of the midterm election so far, not just because there was no overwhelming Republican wave, but also because America rejected, generally speaking, the path to its own demise. It rejected punditry. The election underscored how meaningless and misleading so much of the prognosticating on competitive races has become. So much of it is just chatter, people guessing, people spinning data into hard facts. Too many pundits want to be the smart one who sees something in the numbers that others miss. They want to be diviners, but end up being deliverers of misinformation. And their misdirection is infectious. Groupthink sets in as pundits begin to absorb and repeat what they've heard from other pundits. For the public, the preponderance of sources and repetition of the same tired points lends credence to assumptions that are baseless. We were led to believe that momentum had shifted decidedly toward Republicans in the last few weeks. It hadn't. There was no red wave. There were no massive gains for Republicans. We are still waiting to see if they will take control of the House, and the Senate may stay in Democratic hands. We were led to believe that Hispanics were defecting from Democrats in shocking numbers. The truth appears to have been more nuanced. According to exit polls, which we always have to take with a grain of salt, the slippage may have been about 5% in some parts of the country, but some candidates, like Beto O'Rourke in Texas, held on to Hispanics at the same rate President Biden did in 2020, or even increased that level of support, like Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada. We were led to believe that black men were also drifting away from the Democrats. That's not entirely true. Look at Georgia, where the great fear was that black men wouldn't vote for Stacey Abrams, a slightly higher percentage voted for her in this election in that state than voted for Biden in 2020, according to exit polls. Please like the video.
One of the most sobering statements from President Biden's speech last week on protecting democracy was one that might well have gone unnoticed by many who heard it or read about it. In the speech, Biden pointed out, the remarkable thing about American democracy is this, just enough of us, on just enough occasions, have chosen not to dismantle democracy but to preserve democracy. The sentence is damning. The dismantling of our democracy is just one apathetic electorate, one slate of voter suppression laws or one barrage of misinformation away. Modern presidential elections don't often end in landslides. In fact, no president has won by a margin of the popular vote greater than 10 percentage points since Ronald Reagan in 1984. Biden's margin of victory over Donald Trump was only 4 percentage points. These slim margins are obscured by the flaws and peculiarities of our electoral process, how small states are overrepresented and most states award electors on a winner-take-all basis. Biden won Georgia by just over 12,000 votes, which was just 0.2 percent of the votes cast in the state, but Biden got all 16 of the state's electoral votes. That's how we elect presidents in this country. But that same fluke means that the country's last two Republican presidents were able to win the Electoral College while losing the popular vote, George Bush in 2000 and Trump in 2016. This is all to say that we are always a cat's whisker away from calamity. And that doesn't go only for presidential elections. The same dilemma has plagued this year's midterms as control of Congress hangs in the balance, with the anti-democracy barbarians at the door. It is widely believed that Republicans will retake control of the House of Representatives, the only question being by what margin. But the control of the Senate is very much in play, with some of the most hotly contested races playing out in states that often swing presidential elections, like Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona and Wisconsin. Please like the video. After all this country has been through, from Donald Trump and his election denial, to the insurrection, to what prosecutors call the politically motivated attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband, it still appears poised to elect candidates next Tuesday who deny the results of the 2020 election. There are 291 election deniers on the ballot. And Trump, the greatest threat to democracy, may make a comeback in 2024. It's hard to believe even though it's happening right in front of our eyes. In a major speech Wednesday night, President Biden described election denial as the path to chaos in America. It's unprecedented, he said. It's unlawful. And it's un-American. But in truth, the extremism, racism and white nationalism are neither un-American nor unfamiliar. I am personally fascinated by precedents and historical corollaries, the ways that events find a way of repeating themselves, not because of some strange glitch in the cosmos but because human beings are fundamentally the same, unchanged, stuck in rotation of our failings and frailties. The presidential election of 1912 offers a few lessons for our current political moment. William Howard Taft had been elected president in 1908, succeeding the gregarious Theodore Roosevelt, the undisputed leader of the progressive movement of the age, who endorsed Taft's presidential bid. But Taft was no Teddy. Taft was, as University of Notre Dame professor Perry E. Arnold has written, a warm-hearted and kind man who wanted to be loved as a person and to be respected for his judicial temperament. I hear echoes there of the differences between Presidents Barack Obama and Biden. Progressives at first seemed satisfied with Taft's election, as they expected him to simply carry Roosevelt's legacy forward. But they soon grew disaffected, as did Roosevelt. It wasn't that Taft was ineffective, he just didn't do all of what those progressives wanted, much like Biden hasn't checked the box on all progressive priorities. Riding a wave of progressive anger, Roosevelt challenged Taft in 1912, and when Roosevelt didn't secure the nomination, he ran as a third-party candidate, taking many of the progressives with him. That split all but guaranteed that their opponent, Woodrow Wilson, would win, becoming the first president from the South since the Civil War. Wilson had not been a favorite to win the nomination of his own party, he only secured it on the 46th ballot after quite a bit of deal-making. But once he reached the general election, he sailed to victory over the quarreling liberals. 
He would go on to campaign on an America First platform, which for him was primarily about maintaining America's neutrality in World War I. But as Sarah Churchwell, author of Behold, America, told Vox in 2018, it soon became associated not just with isolationism, but also with the Ku Klux Klan, xenophobia, and fascism. Please like the video. Honestly, I never expected this episode of Kanye West drama to last as long as it has. I certainly didn't expect myself to care much about it. I figured I'd weigh in once and move on. Billionaire maker of ugly shoes and oversized jackets ends career with reckless mouth. That, I thought, would be it. But it hasn't been. His embrace of anti-black, anti-Semitic and white supremacist language wasn't the only thing that interested me. I have also been watching the reactions to his fall, which, in all their strange contradictions, have exposed ugly truths about power in this country, who can and will demand accountability, how corporations exploit culture and character until they imperil profits, how some people absorb and accept insult and give too long a leash to those with the most money and most fame. Let me first say this, West, who now goes by ye, should have become a pariah when he was talking about slavery as a choice, making a mockery of black ancestors whose suffering was anything but a choice. No one would choose rape for themselves, their mothers, daughters or sisters. No one would choose the noose or the lash. No one would choose a body torn apart by dogs or starved into madness. But he wasn't vanquished. He offered a weak tea apology, and the odiousness of the offense faded. People packed his concerts and bought his clothing. Corporations flocked to be associated with him. He should have become a pariah when he gushed over Donald Trump in the Oval Office and said of his mega hat, there was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. But nothing. The deals continued. The legend grew. So long as he was a black man positioning himself in opposition to black people's interests, he was a phenom. He was counterculture. He was a disruptor. He was above and beyond conventional thinking and conventional labels. But of course, he wasn't beyond labels. Black people have known for centuries what to call people like ye, who claim to be the epitome of blackness but enrich themselves by defaming it and commodifying its culture. There are many names for what he is, but one of the printable ones is sellout. It's even more complicated than that, though, complicated by what centuries of being exposed to the poison of white supremacy has done to black culture. The black people ye most offended didn't have the power to cancel him, the black people with the most power stayed silent, the white corporate structure determined that there was still money to be made, and too many in the broader black population remained in awe of his wealth and his anointing by white corporations and white culture as artistic and exceptional. He had big deals with big brands and he was making big money. He was beating the system, so many would say. He was a genius because he could bend the machine that works against so many black people to work for him. That was power. That was pull. Please like the video. I got a little emotional voting this year. First, I went to the wrong neighborhood school, where a poll worker carefully searched for my name and then explained that I was registered at the Bethesda Elementary School down the road. When I got there, a team of volunteers, my neighbors, from eager 20-somethings to gray-haired retirees, patiently explained how to mark the paper ballot. When my cell phone suddenly rang, they practically strangled me, shut that off. This was the best of America, these people, this process, carried out with integrity and solemnity. What a privilege to be able to vote this way. And what an absurdity that it was these very same people and this very same process that Donald Trump spent the past two years smearing and undermining, managing to bring a majority of his party along with him and his giant, fraudulent claim that the 2020 election was stolen from him. But wait, where was Trump last week? Did you hear allegations by him or his lackeys that these midterm elections were stolen from his hand-picked candidates? 
Other than some baseless claims by Trump here and there, including that the failed Arizona candidate for Governor Carrie Lake, a clownish Trump impersonator, was being cheated, there wasn't much. Trump instead spent most of his energy denigrating some of his anointed candidates and blaming his wife and others for persuading him to endorse the bizarre collection of election-denying sycophants who became Team Trump in this election and lost almost every big race. The fact that Trump is not today filing lawsuits on behalf of each one to try to prove election fraud speaks volumes. It's Trump basically telling them all. Sorry, this lie about stolen elections only pertains to me. There is only room for one martyr in this party. You don't get to use my lie in your state elections. I only backed unprincipled, ambitious people like you, J.D. Vance and Mehmet Oz and Doug Mastriano and Adam Laxalt, to amplify my lie in order to prove I'm not a loser. I can never be seen as a loser. If you're losers, it's your fault. That also explains why most of the election deniers who lost, like Oz, simply conceded and did not claim fraud. Why not raise a ruckus, Mehmet? Hey, J.D., why aren't you alleging that your Republican colleagues lost because their elections were rigged, the way you did for Trump? What about you, Doug? What was it you said on Sunday when you conceded losing the governor's race in Pennsylvania, difficult to accept as the results are, there is no right course but to concede, which I do? What? Why is that the right course today, but it wasn't the right course for Trump two years ago? Because none of you ever believed Trump's lie to begin with, so you never dared deploy it in your own elections. You were just renting Trump's lie on the belief that it was your golden ticket, your easy shortcut, to victory. You thought you could echo Trump's lie, get elected with the votes of his supporters, and then just drop it. Now that most of you have failed to get elected on election denialism, you want us to forget how you shamefully tried to exploit that lie to gain power, while you slink away. Please like the video. There was no good time for Vladimir Putin's unprovoked, idiotic invasion of Ukraine. But this is a uniquely bad time. Because it's diverting worldwide attention and resources needed to mitigate climate change during what may be the last decade when we still have a chance to manage the climate extremes that are now unavoidable and avoid those that could become unmanageable. Unfortunately, what happens between Ukraine and Russia does not stay between Ukraine and Russia. That's because the world is flatter than ever. We have connected so many people, places, and markets to so many other people, places, and markets, and then removed so many of the old buffers that insulated us from one another's successes and replaced them with Greece, that instability in one node can now go really far, really wide, really fast. That is why I've argued that Russia's attack on Ukraine is the real world war I. Two-thirds of the planet's people can now watch it on their smartphones, and virtually everyone has been or will be touched by this war economically, geopolitically, and, maybe most important, environmentally. The best way to appreciate that is by talking to people who live in some of the world's most remote ecosystems. I'm talking about indigenous communities residing deep inside and protecting the world's remaining forests, particularly the megaforests free of roads, power lines, mines, cities, and industrial agriculture. These intact forests, from those in the Amazon and Congo River basins to ones in Canada, Russia, and Ecuador, are the world's life support system. They sponge billions of tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, generating oxygen, filtering fresh water to drink, and generally strengthening our resilience against the pressures of climate change. These forests and their indigenous people were already under pressure from global economic forces, but Putin's war set off a cascade of negative effects. Russia is one of the largest fertilizer producers in the world. The largest oil exporter to global markets. And more than a quarter of the world's wheat is normally exported by Russia and Ukraine, providing bread for billions of people, as well as barley, sunflower seed oil, and corn. Because of both the war and sanctions on Russia, shortages and prices on these commodities have spiked, increasing pressures all over the planet to strip more intact forests to drill for oil, plant crops for agribusinesses, and create land for cattle grazing. 
Last week, Miatero, a global nonprofit that supports the indigenous peoples who are guardians of these endangered forests, invited me to moderate a public discussion by indigenous leaders visiting New York City for Climate Week. Nia Taro points to statistics showing that indigenous territories encompass over a third of Earth's intact forests and similar portions of other vital ecosystems, safeguarding a significant share of the world's biodiversity. Carbon stored in indigenous forests in the Amazon, for instance, is far less likely to be lost to the atmosphere than that on private and other unprotected lands. Unfortunately, the more we destroy these forests, peatlands, and mangroves, it also becomes far less likely that we will get anywhere near the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Namati Nankimo won the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2020 for leading a legal fight on behalf of indigenous communities in Ecuador, one of the 10 most biodiverse countries on Earth, that resulted in a court ruling protecting 500,000 acres of Amazonian rainforest and Warani territory from oil extraction, the citation said. Ninkimo's leadership in the lawsuit set a legal precedent for indigenous rights in Ecuador, and other tribes are following in her footsteps to protect additional tracts of rainforest from oil extraction. Please like the video. Munich, last week was an interesting week to be in Europe talking to national security experts, officials, and business executives about Ukraine. Ukraine and its allies had just forced Russian invaders into a chaotic retreat from a big chunk of territory, while the leaders of China and India had seemed to make clear to Vladimir Putin that the food and energy inflation his war has stoked was hurting their 2.7 billion people. On top of all that, one of Russia's iconic pop stars told her 3.4 million followers on Instagram that the war was turning our country into a pariah and worsening the lives of our citizens. In short, it was Putin's worst week since he invaded Ukraine, without wisdom, justice, mercy, or a plan B. And yet. Maybe I was just hanging around the wrong people, but I detected a certain undertow of anxiety in many of my conversations with Ukraine's European allies. I learned long ago as a foreign correspondent that sometimes the news is in the noise, in what is being said and shouted, and sometimes the news is in the silence, in what isn't being said at all. And my entire piratation of what wasn't being said last week went like this, yes, it is great that Ukraine is pushing the Russians back some, but can you answer me the question that has been hanging out there since the fighting started, how does this war end with a stable result? We still don't know. As I probed that question in my conversations, I discerned three possible outcomes, some totally new, some familiar, but all coming with complicated and unpredictable side effects. Outcome one is a total Ukrainian victory, which risks Putin doing something crazy as defeat and humiliation stare him in the face. Outcome two is a dirty deal with Putin that secures a ceasefire and stops the destruction, but it risks splintering the Western allies and enraging many Ukrainians. Outcome 3 is a less dirty deal, we go back to the lines where everyone was before Putin invaded in February. Ukraine might be ready to live with that, and maybe even the Russian people would, too, but Putin would have to be ousted first, because he would never abide the undeniable implication that his war was completely for naught. The variance among these outcomes is profound, and few of us will not be affected by which way it goes. You may not be interested in a Ukraine war, but the Ukraine war will be interested in you, in your energy and food prices, and, most important, in your humanity, as even the neutrals, China and India, have discovered. So let's go under the hood of all three possible endings. Outcome 1 no one expects the Ukrainian army to be able to immediately follow up its substantial military gains of the past two weeks by just sweeping the rest of the Russian army back across the border. But for the first time I could hear people asking, what if the Russian army actually collapses? Surely more than a few Russian soldiers, and the Russian-speaking Ukrainians who threw in their lot with them, thinking they would win and stay forever, are now asking themselves the John Kerry Vietnam War question. How do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? 
Everyone can now see just what a big lie this whole war was. Everyone hears the stories that some of the reinforcements Putin is sending to the front are convicts who bartered their way out of prison by agreeing to fight in Ukraine for six months. Many others are mercenaries from as far away as Syria. Wait a minute. If Ukraine really had become, as Putin claimed, a state led by Nazis and the spearhead of a NATO plan to push farther east toward the Russian motherland, how could Putin not ask the Russian people to mobilize for that fight? If the cause was so just and the war so necessary, why did Putin have to pay criminals and mercenaries to rise up and expect the middle classes of Moscow and Leningrad to just shut up? People talk, and every Russian soldier or Russian-speaking Ukrainian who sided with Putin has to be thinking, do I stay? Do I run? Who will protect me if the front breaks? Such an alliance is highly vulnerable to cascading collapse, first slowly and then quickly. Watch out. Why? Because Putin has already alluded several times to being willing to contemplate using a nuclear weapon if Ukraine and its NATO allies start to overwhelm his forces and he is staring at complete humiliation. I sure hope the CIA has a covert plan to interrupt Putin's chain of command so no one would push the button. Outcome 2, I cannot imagine President Volodymyr Zelensky accepting a ceasefire or something near it right now, with his forces currently having so much momentum and his having committed to recovering every inch of Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. But keep this outcome in the back of your mind as winter sets in and Putin's refusal to sell natural gas to Europe drives up energy prices so high that it forces more factories to close and poorer Europeans to choose between heating and eating. Please like the video. The defiant timing of Donald Trump's announcement of his candidacy for president in 2024, dropping amid Republican recriminations over their midterm disappointments, is an admission of weakness poorly disguised as a show of strength. The intended flex is obvious, the early announcement is meant to cow potential rivals, force them to come off the blocks explicitly running against him, seize the media spotlight, run up endorsements and fundraising totals, and hopefully elevate the former president in national polling. It's also intended as a preemptive political strike against any potential indictment that might be awaiting him, assuring Republican primary voters that the Biden Department of Justice is coming after him only because they want to keep him from the White House. Even before the midterm results, though, it was a sign of Trump's potential weakness that such calculation was even necessary. If the former president were as strong as he wished everyone to imagine him to be, he could have afforded to wait in Mar-a-Lago, accepting supplicants, while any pretenders exhausted themselves with feudal campaigning and the people clamored for their once and future king. Instead, he decided on this move, telegraphing it before the midterms, because his position had steadily weakened over the course of 2022. The emergence of Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida as the singular, popular, potentially deep-pocketed rival, the drip-drip of state polling showing DeSantis competitive with Trump, the uncertain politics of a potential prosecution, the pre-election polling showing more Republicans identifying with their party than with Trump, it all created a scenario in which the former president remained the favorite, but he clearly needed to do more to win than simply show up. And now the results of the election, the DeSantis landslide in Florida and the consistent underperformance of Trump-associated Republican candidates nationwide, have made it uncertain whether the former president should even be considered the 2024 favorite anymore. This isn't just a matter of Trump-skeptical conservatives griping on Tivadir or anonymous Republican politicians hoping vaguely that this time will be different, a pair of post-election surveys of potential GOP voters, one national and one of delegate-rich Texas, show DeSantis suddenly in the lead. So do polls of early primary and caucus states commissioned by the Club for Growth, a formerly Trump-allied outfit, now increasingly aligned against him. A Politico Morning Consult poll released today shows Trump leading DeSantis nationally 47 to 33 percent, so it's too soon to talk about Trump as a primary season underdog. But even that poll suggests he's starting under 50 percent, 
despite a claim to incumbency and universal name recognition, which suggests a difficult battle for the nomination rather than an easy coast or coronation. Please like the video. It's easy to say what a triumphant midterm election would have looked like for opponents of abortion. The ballot initiative installing abortion rights into the Michigan Constitution would have failed. Pro-life measures in Kentucky and Montana would have succeeded. And Republicans would have enjoyed a sweeping victory in both the Senate and the House, making talk of a November backlash against the Dobbs decision obsolete. In each case, the reverse happened, the pro-life side lost every statewide ballot in liberal California and Vermont as well as in the states just listed, and the Republicans underperformed expectations. This has revived the summertime assumption that the Dobbs decision was a political disaster for the GOP. It's confirmed professional Democrats in their abortion-centric campaign strategy. And it's divided pro-lifers between optimists who think the Republicans just need to learn how to message more effectively about abortion and pessimists who think the results reveal the movement dead in the water, to quote the conservative writer Aaron Wren. Let's start with what the pro-life pessimists get right. Tuesday's results confirm the anti-abortion movement's fundamental disadvantages, while Americans are conflicted about abortion, a majority is more pro-choice than pro-life, the pro-choice side owns almost all the important cultural megaphones, and voters generally dislike sudden unsettlements of social issues. You can strategize around these problems to some extent, contrasting incremental protections for the unborn with the left's pro-choice absolutism. But when you're the side seeking a change in settled arrangements, voters may still choose the absolutism they know over the uncertainty of where pro-life seal might take them. However, when abortion wasn't directly on the ballot, many of those same voters showed no inclination to punish politicians who backed abortion restrictions. Any pro-choice swing to the Democrats was probably a matter of a couple of points in the overall vote for the House of Representatives. Meanwhile, Republican governors who signed heartbeat legislation in Texas, Georgia and Ohio easily won re-election, and there was no dramatic backlash in red states that now restrict abortion. In other words, Republicans in 2022 traded a larger margin in the House and maybe a Senate seat or two for a generational goal, the end of Roe v. Wade. And more than that, they demonstrated that many voters who might vote pro-choice on an up-down ballot will also accept, for the time being, pro-life legislation in their states. Please like the video. Although Democrats shocked the political world by overperforming in this week's elections, there's still a good chance Republicans will end up controlling the House. If so, there will be zero time to waste, lawmakers should use the lame duck period before the new Congress is sworn in to build safeguards against a GOP-controlled House's capacity to sow full-blown chaos. This imperative doesn't apply just to Democrats. Plenty of Republicans, particularly in the Senate, discern the threats posed by a GOP House. They could join Democrats in acting for the good of the country and for the good of their own party as well. Political scientist Jonathan Bernstein calls this the crazy-proofing agenda, and, in at least some of these cases, that's not much of an overstatement. Here are five ways Congress can act in the lame duck period, if necessary. Defuse future debt ceiling crises. Return to menu. House Republicans are already threatening to use potential breaches of the debt limit which would trigger default and economic disaster to extract policy concessions from President Biden and Democrats on other fronts. Congress should neutralize this weapon of extortion, because even the mere playing of this game threatens severe damage. In the lame duck, Democrats in the Senate joined by Republicans who recognize the threat could raise the debt limit beyond what would be needed during the Biden presidency or even much higher, rendering it void. Or Congress could transfer control of debt limit hikes to the Treasury Secretary. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Kentucky, and other Republicans might see self-interested motives for this. Imagine Donald Trump running for president next year while urging a megafied House to maximize debt limit extortion to damage Biden. Would incoming House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, really resist? McConnell might not want to get caught between Trump and GOP senators who don't want to imperil the global economy. Any GOP House majority is now certain to be very narrow, 
which would only further empower the Mega Caucus to create chaos by withholding its support for debt limit hikes. McCarthy would be loath to raise the limit with Democrats because that could subject him to the Mega Caucus wrath and possibly mean a leadership challenge. But in truth, this is a no-brainer even if Republicans don't win the House because the debt limit is a useless relic. There's no good faith reason to weaponize it as it involves borrowing to cover spending Congress has already appropriated. If 10 GOP senators won't act, Democrats should use the simple majority reconciliation process to raise and neutralize it. Please like the video. For years, John Fetterman has wagered that steadily showing up in areas hostile to Democrats would ultimately pay off. After getting elected as Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor in 2018, Fetterman conducted a listening tour of the state's 67 counties. As a Senate candidate, he campaigned in 57 of them, interrupted only by his stroke. New data provided to me by the American Communities Project, ACP, offers a detailed picture of how well this worked. With Fetterman winning his Senate race by nearly five points, the nature of his victory shows how Democrats can continue rebuilding in the Blue Wall states after Donald Trump's two campaigns substantially weakened them in the region. Other Democrats succeeded in the Blue Wall states, of course. Josh Shapiro was decisively elected governor of Pennsylvania, and Tony Evers and Gretchen Whitmer were both re-elected as governors in Wisconsin and Michigan, where Democrats captured the state legislature, too. But Fetterman's victory might be uniquely instructive. He defeated a candidate, Mehmet Oz, who was conventionally stronger than those other Democrats' opponents. He combined an unorthodox issue profile, marijuana legalization, prison clemency, with an unorthodox campaign style, lumbering giant in hoodie and cargo shorts, helping make very tough political territory more competitive again. Joe Biden won Pennsylvania by only one point in 2020. How this happened is illustrated by the ACP data. Fetterman significantly reduced his opponent's margins of victory relative to Biden's 2020 performance against Trump in three types of counties where Trump has done extraordinarily well. In the ACP's taxonomy, those three county types are known as the middle suburbs, working class country, and rural middle America. The middle suburbs. These types of suburban counties are wider and more working class than your typical entering suburb, which tends to be more diverse, cosmopolitan, and professional. We often think of the suburbs as anti-Trump, but his large margins in middle suburbs across the country were key to his 2016 victory. For years later, when Trump made veiled racial appeals to the suburban housewives of America, these are the places he probably meant to target. Please like the video. Donald Trump has long harbored a tendency to confess to his sins in public. Now he's done it again, revealing a large truth about today's Republican Party in the process. He declared that his lies about the 2020 election are instrumentally useful in motivating GOP base voters. Trump raised this in a call with Blake Masters, the Republican nominee in the Arizona Senate race that was captured in a new Fox News documentary. Trump faulted Masters for saying at a debate that he didn't see evidence of a rigged 2020 election and urged Masters to be stronger on that point. You're going to lose that base, Trump told Masters, citing Carrie Lake, the GOP candidate who might win the state's governor's race, Karis winning with very little money. And if they say, how is your family? She says the election was rigged and stolen. Trump is not always right about this. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp will likely win re-election despite publicly defying Trump's pressure to steal the 2020 election. Glenn Youngkin became Virginia governor while carefully couching his appeals to the base's anger about 2020 in scripted, anodyne terms. But it is unavoidably clear that many Republican elites have decided that adhering to or merely humoring Trump's 2020 lies is essential to feeding that anger, and that they view these lies as a critical mobilizing tool in the midterm elections. Trump singled out Lake, and she illustrates the point perfectly. Lake echoes Trump's lies about 2020, 
but has also refused to commit to accepting a loss herself, insisting voters don't trust the integrity of our elections. Lake's own state recently passed an onerous voter suppression bill in the name of election integrity. Yet she keeps citing mistrust of elections to justify the potential treatment of future losses as non-binding. As Steve Benen notes, no amount of election integrity legislation is likely to ever get people like Lake to accept losses as legitimate. Please like the video. When Donald Trump starts belittling you with a sandbox nickname, you know you're in real trouble, especially if you're a Republican with ambitions for higher office. The Florida governor's allies were said to be shocked and upset when Trump described Ron DeSantis over the weekend as Ron DeSanctimonious. The slur is the latest in the worsening feud between the two Republicans, both potential 2024 presidential nominees. With the two men holding competing rallies in Florida over the weekend, the New York Times reports that Trump is irritated with DeSantis' challenge to his dominance. In a bizarre turn, the Times also reports that Trump's desanctimonious barb was an angry reaction to a new ad from DeSantis, which presents the Florida governor as a divinely anointed figure. On the eighth day, DeSantis' ad intones, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a protector. So God made a fighter. It's amusing that this is what triggered Trump's anger, only he can be the anointed one, of course, but this has more significance than it appears. It shows Trump grasps the religiously inspired nature of large swaths of his support, and why DeSantis might pose a real threat to him. DeSantis seems to be speaking to the Christian nationalist or evangelical bases craving for a divinely infused candidate who promises to use the power of the presidency to block the nation's slide into demographic, moral, cultural and secular ruin. For help understanding this dynamic, I reached out to Sarah Posner, a historian of the religious right and its impact on conservative politics. This interview has been edited and condensed. Greg Sargent, it's telling that Trump was rattled by DeSantis' new video, which presents the Florida governor as a kind of savior candidate, a figure anointed by God to save our country. Should we see this Christian nationalist trope as a genuine message about the case DeSantis will make if he runs for president? Sarah Posner, Trump knows that his base believes God anointed him to lead America at a critical juncture, and that many of them believe him to be a messianic figure who alone can rescue America from what they call demonic forces, liberalism, civil rights, deep state, and more. None of Trump's potential rivals have so blatantly tried to claim that divine blessing. It's a very dangerous sign that DeSantis is reading the base, which has been bombarded with ever more radical claims of anointings, prophecy and spiritual warfare against the left, as receptive to savior alternatives to Trump. Please like the video. As Elon Musk's acquisition of Tividir edged toward reality this week, he suffered an uncharacteristic onset of humility. His version of social media will be a global force for good, he insisted, vowing that it will help humanity, whom I love. Unironically, Mask managed to declare that his magnanimity will help secure that the future of civilization. Mask's takeover will certainly have international ramifications, if not yet interplanetary ones. But they may not be that sunny. The world's richest man buying perhaps the world's most influential political echo chamber is the latest sign of a development that international relations experts have long feared, with tech giants amassing stratospheric levels of influence over global affairs, they are morphing into a species of geopolitical actor, with uncertain long-term consequences. Those experts have a term for this development, technopolarity. The idea is that big tech companies have become their own sovereigns, on a par with nation-states. The result, an increasingly unchecked level of influence over international affairs that will demand a new kind of political response, it's one of the most important issues playing out on the geopolitical stage, Ian Bremer, the president of Eurasia Group, told me. Beyond Mask's acquisition of Tividir, troubling new details have emerged about his efforts to influence the Russia-Ukraine conflict through his proposal of a pro-Russia peace plan and his zigzagging on internet access for Ukraine via his Starlink satellite network. 
All this illustrates the potential dark side of this brave new technopolarity. Masks funding for Starlink access to Ukraine has been a boon to the Ukrainian resistance. But this week the New York Times reported that during Ukraine's mid-September offensive recapturing territories invaded by Russia, Mask may have a geofenced internet service, rendering it temporarily unavailable in certain areas. That came after Mask confusingly threatened that Starlink might cease funding Ukraine's internet access. Mask reversed course after an international outcry and after he entered into talks with the Pentagon. Amid all this, Mask privately pushed his peace plan with political and business elites more urgently than previously known, The Times reports. The plan would cede seized Ukrainian lands to Russia, and was widely panned as an effort to weaken international support for the Ukrainian cause. The point is not that Mask shouldn't play any role in funding internet access for Ukraine. Rather, it's that the situation illustrates how much influence Mask and figures like him wield over global events. Please like the video. I called Mark Levine, the Manhattan Borough President, on Monday morning to see how worried he was about New York's governor's race. Levine, a Democrat who had just come from campaigning with Governor Kathy Hochul, was pretty worried. Yes, polls have shown Hochul consistently ahead of the Trumpist Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin, but Levine thought the race could go either way. I don't think we know how accurate polls are in New York State, Levine told me, noting how long it's been since New York has had a competitive statewide general election. And there's no doubt that Zeldin has used the crime issue to whip up energy on his side. There are many reasons to be aghast at the idea of a gun-loving election denier taking power in a state that's been as reliably liberal as New York. One of them is what Zeldin might do to New York's status as a haven for abortion access. Though Zeldin is a co-sponsor in the House of the Life at Conception Act, which would bestow full personhood rights on embryos, he's tried to neutralize abortion as a campaign issue by insisting that he couldn't change New York's abortion law even if he wanted to. There's something bizarre about this argument, as Assemblywoman Deborah Glick pointed out to me, Zeldin is telling pro-choice New Yorkers that we can rely on the legislature to protect us from him. And while it's true that Zeldin wouldn't be able to ban abortion anytime soon, there are many things, short of making abortions illegal, that a governor can do to make them harder to get. Zeldin's strategy is similar to the one that Christine Drazen, the anti-abortion Republican with a decent chance of becoming governor of Oregon, is employing in her race. Both are trying to use Democrats' success in passing state-level abortion protections against them by arguing that these laws make their personal opposition to abortion moot. I will not change and could not change New York's abortion law, Zeldin said in one ad, while Drazen told Oregon Public Broadcasting that Roe is codified into Oregon law. Regardless of my personal opinions on abortion, as governor, I will follow the law. But when it comes to reproductive rights, the letter of the law isn't the only thing that matters. Please like the video. Portland, Oregon, an ad for one of the candidates for governor of Oregon begins with shots of trash and the tarp-covered tent encampments that line many of Portland's streets. Nobody in Oregon would say, let's keep doing exactly what we've been doing, says the candidate. She continues, I called for a homelessness state of emergency nearly three years ago, while Kate Brown, the current Democratic governor, did nothing. It's not a surprising message in a campaign in which homelessness and crime are central issues. What's surprising is the messenger, Tina Kotek, the former Democratic Speaker of the Oregon House, running to succeed Brown. Kotex ad is a sign of the indefensibility of the status quo in one of the country's most progressive cities, and of the unexpected political peril Oregon Democrats face as a result. Most polls show that her opponent, Christine Drazen, the former Republican minority leader in Oregon's House, has a slight lead in the race. If Drazen wins, it will be a sign that no place is immune to the right's message on public disorder whose resonance is also making Governor Kathy Hochul's race to keep her post in New York uncomfortably close. A Republican hasn't won the Oregon governor's race in 40 years. 
And while progressive states electing GOP governors is nothing new, Drazen, like New York's Republican gubernatorial nominee, Lee Zeldin, is far more conservative than the Rockefeller-style Republicans who lead Massachusetts and Vermont. She has an A rating from the NRA and an endorsement from Oregon Right to Life, meaning that just months after the end of Roe v. Wade, Oregon could end up with an abortion opponent in charge. Some Oregon Democrats argue that Drazen's competitiveness is a fluke, a product of the well-funded spoiler campaign being run by Betsy Johnson, a centrist ex-Democrat who has received $3.75 million from the Nike co-founder Phil Knight. But that doesn't explain why so many Democrats are willing to defect to Johnson in the first place. 538's polling average has her getting 13.8% of the vote. Nor does it explain why Democrats are struggling in congressional districts neighboring Portland. The Cook Political Report rates Oregon's 6th district, which went for Joe Biden by 13 points, a toss-up, even though the Republican nominee is, like George's Herschel Walker, an abortion opponent who reportedly paid for the abortion of a woman he dated. Four of our six House seats could end up in red territory, Senator Jeff Merkley told me after a rally here with Kotek and Bernie Sanders. The fact that Sanders was in Oregon in the first place, Biden and Elizabeth Warren have also come through, is a sign of how shaky things are for Democrats in the formerly safely blue state. Please like the video. Vancouver, Washington, in March, five months before he became the Republican nominee in a Vasington state congressional race, Joe Kent appeared on a webcast hosted by a Gen Z white nationalist group called the American Populist Union. Kent, who would soon be endorsed by Donald Trump, was there to explain his disavowal of Nick Fuentes, a smirking 24-year-old far-right influencer whom the New York Times has described as a prominent white supremacist. On one side of the split screen was David Carlson, the American Populist Union's baby-faced chief content officer. On the other was Kent, a movie star handsome former Green Beret in a plaid flannel shirt, with an American flag hanging behind him. What followed was a 45-minute conversation in which Kent attempted a dance that's become common in today's GOP, remaining in the good graces of the far right while putting some distance between himself and its most abhorrent avatars. Kent had spoken on the phone to Fuentes, a Holocaust denier and Vladimir Putin admirer who believes women shouldn't be allowed to vote, earlier in his campaign to unseat Rep. Jamie Herrera Boitler, one of the ten Republicans who'd voted to impeach Trump. They apparently discussed social media strategy. Their association had become a problem in Kent's primary, and eventually Kent tweeted that he didn't want Fuentes' endorsement because of his focus on race-slash-religion. But this rejection infuriated some of Kent's most reactionary supporters. Fuentes himself went after Kent in a three-and-a-half-hour live stream. So Kent appeared on the American Populist Union's webcast, the group has since changed its name to American Virtue, to explain himself. There, he spoke about how white people are discriminated against in America, called for an immigration moratorium, and said the United States is the only country that recognizes that our rights are inherent and they come from God, not from government. Carlson pressed him, why, given Kent's own religious and nationalist convictions, did he consider Fuentes divisive? It's more of a tactics thing, Kent said. He noted that he has moral qualms about Fuentes giggling praise for Hitler, but said that where they really differ is on strategy. Running out there and saying, this movement is for white people and Christians only, said Kent, that is not how you win elections at all. The question of how you win an election in Washington's 3rd Congressional District, a stretch along the southwestern border with Oregon that's been reliably Republican, voting for Trump by four points in 2020 but still considered fairly moderate, is not just a political debate for right-wing YouTube. The race, pitting Kent, a burgeoning mega world star, against Marie Glusenkamp Perez, a 34-year-old rural working-class Democrat who is emphasizing abortion rights, has national implications. It's one that will show us whether Republicans overreached in nominating candidates who speak almost exclusively to their base, or whether politicians like Kent really are the party's future. It will show us just how potent the backlash to the overturning of Roe v. Wade is. 
and it will show us what kind of house we're going to have come 2023, one that is capable of legislating, or one that makes the Tea Party look tame. In other words, the race in Washington's third is an almost perfect microcosm of the broader political forces at work in the fall midterm elections. You've heard it before, until recently, it seemed inevitable that a red wave would crash over America in November. The Democrats' congressional majority is paper-thin, the party in power typically loses midterm seats, and Joe Biden's poll numbers were abysmal, but lately the forecast has turned cloudier, and districts like Washington's third have become surprisingly competitive. Across the country, Republicans have nominated politically inexperienced mega-fanatics who could lose otherwise winnable races, people like the Ohio House candidate J.R. Majewski, a QAnon promoter who performs pro-Trump rap songs and reportedly misrepresented his military service. Kent is one of the more polished of the mega-candidates. His military service, 11 tours, mostly in Iraq, is very real, and he has an immensely sympathetic personal story. In 2019, his wife, a Navy cryptologic technician named Shannon Kent, was killed by an ISIS suicide bomber in northeastern Syria, leaving Joe as the single father to a baby and a toddler. This horrific loss, he's said, helped propel him into politics. Kent holds what he calls the administrative state responsible for his wife's death, arguing that unelected bureaucrats subverted Trump's attempts to pull American troops out of Syria. They were supposed to be out Christmas Eve of 2018, he told me, accusing people close to Secretary of Defense James Mattis, who resigned over the Syria pullout, of slow rolling the process. I 100% blame the administrative state. Kent's anger is understandable, as is his deep disillusionment with the war on terror, which he now sees as a scheme, built on an edifice of lies, to enrich the military-industrial complex. America's foreign wars, he said, were a great way for the ruling class to extract wealth and give themselves more power, 